you will, uh, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we've been walking through spiritual gifts for quite a while now, um, and we are going to continue walking through the gifts themselves, and uh, we're trying to make some practical study of these spiritual gifts so that uh, we know what they are and how they function within the church, and so that we might see them used. Uh, the reality is that every Christian has a spiritual gift, and those gifts are to be used in service to Christ and his church so that the saints might be encouraged, edified, built up in their faith in the Lord Jesus. All along the way, we've used this definition that spiritual gifts are specific graces given by the Holy Spirit to individual believers to divinely empower their edification of other Christians for completeness in Christ. We're going to end there again tonight as we look at the role of the shepherd, uh, the pastor, and one of the things that we'll talk about at the very end is that that is what the shepherd keeps in mind. That's his, that is his end goal. It's what he is focused on, is having, having that opportunity to present the church to the Lord Jesus, complete and blameless at the last day. When we look at these spiritual gifts, uh, we've been talking about, uh, in recent weeks, some of the speaking gifts. So we've looked at the gift of exhortation, and we've looked at the gift of prophecy, and last week we looked at the gift of teaching, and tonight we're going to look at the gift of the shepherd. And one of the things that we'll say at the out front is that the gift of the shepherd is not so much an office as it is a function. Uh, it is a role, a work, a, a task. And we are going to connect this to the office of the elder or the overseer or the bishop. All those words mean the same thing. We'll talk about that again. We've talked about it before. But we're going to see that what Paul outlines in Ephesians 4 in the, the work or the gift or the shepherd uh, is really more about the function of this gift, the work of this gift, the way that it is lived out. And we're going to see that this is what, uh, this is what the elder is called to, to be a shepherd to God's people. So we'll read together Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 11 through 14. And this is the foundation. In fact, uh, when we look at this word shepherd in the New Testament, this is the only time that we have this word uh, used in reference to a gift or to uh, a function within the church. We have the idea of shepherding uh, that comes up on a, a couple of occasions, and we're going to look at those. Uh, but other than reference to Jesus himself as a shepherd, or, or other than reference to, uh, to the function of shepherds uh, in the life of Israel, this is the only reference we have uh, to the shepherd in terms of a, a role or a work within the New Testament church. So Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. When it says that he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, uh, one of the things that we ought to highlight here is that these, these officials within the church are not those who do the work of the ministry, or at least they do not do the work of the ministry on their own. And sometimes we treat it that way. Sometimes we look at the pastor, or we look at, at a teacher in the church, or we look at an evangelist, and we say, uh, these are the people who get the job done. We write our check to the church and make sure that they do our ministry for us. That is not the call of Scripture. Everyone in the life of the church is called to engage in the ministry. All of us have a work that God has set out for us. In fact, if we turn back to Ephesians chapter 2, 
you know verses 8 and 9, I'm sure, uh, that it is, for by, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But then look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Every one of us has an assignment. There's a ministry task. There's a work that God has called us to do. A work to do within the life of the church and a work to do outside the life of the church. And the ministry that we are called to, it is essential to the outgoing of God's kingdom, to, to the mission and the message of Christ being extended to all nations. And if we are to fulfill those things, then we must be equipped. I told you this morning about uh, about that task that we had around the house, all this furniture uh, refinishing that we've been doing. Th these are not things that I know how to do uh, in and of myself, and I'm not perfectly equipped to do them, but I've been learning. I've been going to people who know what they're doing and asking some questions and, and having people show me how, and I've been pulling up YouTube videos and watching how to do things, and from that instruction, I've learned how to fulfill the task. It's that way in the church. It's not that prophets and apostles and evangelists and shepherds and teachers are the ones who should do our work for us. No, their job is to equip us to do our work. So one of the things that we sometimes struggle with in the life of the church is, is the question, well, why hadn't the pastor come and seen me? Why, why didn't the preacher call me? Why didn't the preacher show up? Why wasn't he in the hospital room while they had me cut open and pour the holy oil in over me himself? I mean, y'all, we get extreme with these things. And the reason is because we think it's the pastor's job to do all of this on his own. And that's not his job at all. His job is to equip the people of God to do the work for the ministry. It's every much as a part of ministry in the life of the church that a Sunday school teacher would go and see after their class or that a uh, that, that you would care for those who sit at your table on Sunday night or, or that the people you sit in the pew next to, if you know that they have a need, you would step up and, and make sure that that gets met. We all have a work to do in caring for one another, and if we don't all fulfill that work, then the church will never be rightly cared for, no matter how many pastors we hire. So what we want to talk about is how does the shepherd, how does the pastor equip us for the work of the ministry. What's his function in the church? When we talk about this, we, we want to have a definition. So one of the things we've tried to do is to define all of these spiritual gifts along the way. We want to do that even here. So here's the definition that I came up with. It is in no way perfect, but I, I think it is adequate at least. Grace-gifted shepherds, or you can put their pastors. That's uh, If you wonder where does that word pastor come from, because if you open your Bible... Unless you have a paraphrase, you're not going to have the word pastor. Uh, the word pastor is the Latin transliteration uh, of this Greek word, okay? So uh, we get the word pastor, which is a Latinization of the Greek word, and then we've, we've transliterated it into English, and we get our word pastor. But grace-gifted shepherds or grace-gifted pastors are spirit-empowered leaders who extend the ministry of Jesus to his church, by preaching with conviction, evangelizing for conversion, caring with compassion, and guiding for completion. Grace-gifted shepherds are spirit-empowered leaders who extend the ministry of Jesus to his church by preaching with conviction, evangelizing for conversion, caring with compassion, and guiding for completion. When we talk about Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, this is the only passage we have that gives us this spiritual gift of the shepherd. And so uh, one of the things that we need to do, we talked about this some last week, is we need to ask the question, um, is this one office being referred to in Ephesians 4.11 uh, as the office of the shepherd teacher, or are we right to say that there are shepherds and teachers? And so the issue goes to the construction of this in the Greek, where you have one article, the word the, and two nouns, the word for shepherd and the word for teacher. And the question is, what is Paul doing? Why does he combine uh, these two nouns, shepherds and teachers, but only give us one article? Why does he not say the shepherds and the teachers? 
And so a lot of learned men who are far smarter than I am and a lot of learned women have studied the Greek construction and compared this uh, to all of the examples we have of this kind of usage of, a, of an article, a definite article, uh, with two nouns. And what they, uh, what they tell us is that most likely what the Apostle Paul is trying to say is that there are two functions within the church, but that they are closely related, they're interconnected, that there is the role of the shepherd and that a function of the shepherd is to teach, and there is the role of a teacher. Not all teachers are shepherds, but all shepherds are teachers. When we talk about this, it's important because we want to understand that, that while, as we talked about last week, everyone in the church is called to teach at some level, right? We talked about Jesus' commission in Matthew 28, that, that we are to go into all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and teach them to the point of obedience all the things that Jesus commanded us. That's a commission that's given to every disciple. We all have that call, and so to some degree we are all engaging in teaching. And then we talked about that there are others of us who engage in teaching on a, a, a formal level in an official capacity, but then there is yet another distinction to be made, and that is the office of the shepherd, or the function of the shepherd within the church. So not all teachers are shepherds, but all shepherds must be teachers. We'll look at that a little more. Yes, ma'am. Oh, this is the first thing that says it's a good shepherd. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of what we do? Well, we'll, we'll talk. what you want to do, you take care of it. That's true. Yeah, I think that's right. And we'll talk about that some as we look at uh, what, what is a shepherd called to do. Um, but certainly, we, we follow in the, in the footsteps of Christ as our good shepherd. When we talk about this work, one of the things that, that we want to make note of is that, that as we look at the New Testament, and particularly as we look at the book of Acts, we're going to see this office unfold, and we learn more about the function of the shepherd in the church uh, as we go through the, the story of redemption history. As we look at the, the narrative of the New Testament unfold, we learn more and more about that. So what I want us to do, just as a foundation, is to trace the idea of the shepherd or of the elder or the pastor uh, in the New Testament going through the book of Acts. And I think... Uh, that this will be helpful to us. And as we start to do this, one of the things that we need to note, and again, we've talked about this before, if you were here throughout the summer, as we looked at uh, the book of Titus, I've said this week after week after week, that there is one governing teaching office in the church, and it's the office of the pastor. And we use five New Testament words, five Greek words, to refer to one office. Uh, we use the word bishop, we use the word overseer, which both come from the word episkopos. Uh, we use the word elder or the word presbyter, which both come from the word presbyteros. And then we use the word shepherd or pastor, uh, and that is from this word poimen. All of these words refer to one office in the church, and I'm going to show you why we argue that uh, from Acts chapter 20 and a few other places. But let's start in Acts chapter 11. When we look at the New Testament, we look particularly at the book of Acts, and we see the church is forming, There's, there are leaders in the church at the outset. Uh, somebody tell me, who's leading the church at the very beginning? We look at the book of Acts. Who's in charge? Peter, Peter yep. Who is one of the apostles, right? So, so at the beginning of the book of Acts, what we see is a church that is led by the apostles, a church that is heavily influenced by those first core disciples of the Lord Jesus who were witness to his ministry, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. But as we go through the book of Acts, what we see is that to the apostles are also added the elders. And those elders, we're going to argue, uh, are equivalent to pastors or bishops or overseers or presbyters. All those words mean the same thing. So in Acts chapter 11, we see this the first time. In verse 27, Luke tells us this. In these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit 
that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to who? To the elders, right? They sent it to the elders by who? Barnabas and Saul. So the first time that we see this sort of usage of the word elders, and if you do just a quick search of the book of Acts, you will find usages of the word elder before this, but they always refer to the elders in the synagogue or the elders who were equivalent to the scribes and, and functioned among the people of Israel and were not affiliated with the church. But here in Acts chapter 11, as we have this prophetic word that comes to the church about a, a famine that is coming and the need for a, a gift to be given to the church in Jerusalem, in Judea, we have here this acknowledgement that we have other leaders in the church, and these are the elders. The elders are leading the church. It's to the elders we're going to give this financial contribution that we're going to make sure uh, that they have uh, the authority over distributing this to those who have need. Look at Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, we have, I think, another argument for this new class of leaders in the church. Now, don't have the word elders, but here we have the word teachers. And the word teachers here, I think, is being used in a more formal capacity as officials within the church. It says in Acts 13 and verse 1 that there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now, when we talk about prophets and teachers, why am I making the argument that these are leaders in the church equivalent to pastors or elders? Well, number one, because we see that these are clearly uh, functionaries, authoritative functionaries in the church. They have a leading role. They're there praying together, seeking the Lord's face, for the congregation, and it's to them that God calls out from among them Barnabas and Saul and commissions them to a particular work. But it's also because of the last part in verse 3, that after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. That there's a work of ordination here. There's a work of commissioning. Uh, there's this idea that, that we're setting these men apart, and it comes from this core group of leaders. It comes from these prophets and teachers. The reason I think that's significant is because when we look at the remainder of the New Testament, and particularly uh, what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we realize that it's the council of elders that does the work of, of or, ordination, of laying on of hands commissioning people to a particular work. Paul tells Timothy there in 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, that he should remember this gifting of the Spirit that he was given through the laying on of hands. Uh, so we, we're, I think, to acknowledge here leaders in the church equivalent to pastors and elders when Luke gives us this word, teachers, that I think is in a formal capacity. Then if you will, look at Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 19, we have these words. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had Believe. So what do we have here? 
We have Barnabas, we have Saul, they are engaged in this work, they're going about the business that God has called them to, they're, they're, they're fulfilling their ministry of extending the kingdom of God, of making disciples, of planting churches, but then what are they concerned with? What do they want to do before they go on to their next task? They want to make sure that the church is going to be cared for, is going to be shepherded well. And so what do they do? They appoint elders in every church. What does that remind you of? What passage calls to mind when we think about appointing elders? Well, we just spent 10 weeks on it, and maybe we ought to spend 10 more. So Titus chapter 1, and verse 5, right? In Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says to Titus, This is why I left you at Crete, that you might appoint elders in every town. So there is a concern here that the church is cared for, shepherded well, is led well, and where do we do that? How do we do that? Who do we put in place? We put elders in charge, pastors, overseers, bishops these functionary leaders within the church. Look at Acts chapter 15. Again, the gospel's going forward, redemption history is progressing, the church is being established, and we continue to see that a part of the establishment of the church is the role of the pastor. It says in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem. To who? To the apostles and the elders. So now we have these joined together, right? We have two levels of leadership in the Judean church, in the church in Jerusalem. We have apostles and elders. We're seeing the establishment of leadership beyond that first generation of witnesses to the resurrected Lord Jesus, those who were a part of his ministry and had this particular office of the apostle. So they were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, right? And they declared all that God had done with them. Some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. So we see the office of the elder, pastor, bishop, overseer, presbyter. All these words mean the same thing. And this one functionary office is leading in God's church to bring resolve to a matter of theological significance. We see that they did that. If you jump to the end of the chapter in verses 22 and 23, we see that it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas leading men among the brothers with the following letter. And of course what this de details uh, is that there's been a, de a decision made, a consensus reached about how to resolve this matter at the Jerusalem Council concerning whether or not a Gentile had to be come a custom a, a recipient and a believer in the law of Moses in order to be a faithful follower of Christ. Let's go further. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. This is a continuation, the same thing being delivered. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Right? So again, we have this far-reaching influence of this functionary office within the church 
This office that is leading, that is governing, that is teaching. Let me pause right there. We're going to look at a couple of others. But let me pause there and just make note of this. One of the things that we, we struggle with, and we're going to talk about this in our own church, and lots of Baptist churches struggle with this, is the idea of a, a plurality of leadership, having multiple leaders or multiple shepherds or multiple pastors in one church. When we look at the New Testament witness, most of the time what we see is a plurality of leadership. We see multiple elders leading the church. Well, one of the things we also see that we've gotten away from is the idea of reaching beyond one local church and having an affinity or a partnership with another local church or a group of local churches for the purpose of theological reflection, of, of church health, of excellence in commitment to the gospel. You know, when we began developing as a convention of churches, this was one of the things that we practiced. If you go back, like I have, uh, in my historical research, and you look at the minutes of the Baptist Association uh, from the 1800s. In fact, if you go back uh, to the minutes of the St. Clair Association, uh, which used to be called, um, let's see, it's going to leave me right now. Uh, may maybe, maybe the Canoe Creek, I'll have to look at that. But it's, it, it had another name for a long time. But when you go back and you look at the minutes of the association, one of the things that you see is that annually they had topics for theological discussion. And there was a committee of pastors from the local churches responsible for investigating these matters and then bringing a report to the association about how we should stand upon a particular subject based upon the authority of Scripture. And so one of the things that we have in our DNA as Baptists is to be a people who cooperate, not just for the purpose of mission, but also for the purpose of church health. And I think one of the things we should recover is that sort of cooperation for the purpose of church health, ensuring that we are faithful to Christ. Now let me look, show you in Acts chapter 20. This is one of the most pivotal passages when we think about this role of the elder, the pastor, or the bishop. How do all of these things come together? You know, when I say that these all mean the same thing, how do I know that? Well, because of Acts chapter in Acts chapter 20, what we have is Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. Uh, he's at Miletus, and he calls for the Ephesian elders to be brought to him. And so here's what we see in Acts chapter 20, and beginning in verse 17, it says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called who? The elders. Okay, there's, there's number one. He called the elders to, of the church to come to him. <coughs> And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you, none among you, uh, whom I have gone out proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all of what? The flock. There's the pastoral function. Pay careful attention to yourself and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you what? Overseers. There's the Greek term for bishop or overseer. So what we have here is the Apostle Paul addressing one group of people, these elders in the church at Ephesus. And his one address to them, he calls them elders, he says that they've been made overseers, and he says that they are to care, they're to pay attention to the flock in which God has made them overseers. 
That idea of caring for the flock, of paying attention to the flock, is the pastoral function that we see in Ephesians chapter 4. It's that shepherding function. It's the, it's the same word. It's a root word that goes back to this idea of, of shepherding or of leading God's people. When Paul says that those who pay attention to the flock, those who are shepherds, are overseers, he's using that Greek term, overseer or bishop, which comes from the word episkopos. And when he talks about the fact that they are elders, he's using the Jewish word, which is presbyteros, elder or presbyter. And so here in Acts chapter 20, Paul's address to the Ephesian elders or the Ephesian pastors, we have here this consensus that all of these words that are talked about in different ways and that come to bear in different passages are actually referring to one office of leading, teaching, and governing in the church. Let me show you one more. Luke says, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. So what we're seeing in Acts chapter 21 is the church has continued uh, to grow, and as the kingdom of God is expanding, and as the story of redemption's history is being told, what we're seeing is that now the focus is not just on the apostles, though James here represents the apostles as the leader uh, from that generation who saw the ministry of Jesus, the crucifixion and resurrection, and he's a witness to that and a leader in the Jerusalem church, but we also see that there's the establishment of a new level of leadership in the church that will go on beyond the life of the apostles, and that is these leaders who are elders. And what happens there is that they're concerned uh, that Paul is not going to be received well because there's been a rumor campaign spread about him, and so they're giving him some advice as to how to avoid uh, causing a big stink in the city, and of course you know that that actually doesn't happen. They, there's a big stink that's caused anyway. So, are we satisfied that the office of the elder or pastor is equivalent to bishop, overseer, pastor, presbyter, or elder? Right? Any questions about that? All right. So, that means that when we look at the New Testament and we want to paint a picture of this office of the pastor, we are right to go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, to 1 Timothy chapter 5, to Titus chapter 1, and to 1 Peter chapter 5, all of which address the function of the elder or the pastor in the life of the church. I want to stop and I want to ask you a question. And I would love to have some audience participation. The first question I want to ask you, preceding me, so, so this is not pick on the pastor or law of the pastor. We don't get to do either one, okay? If you want to do that, do it later. Uh, but preceding me, I want you to think about the pastors that you've had here at Friendship. We're not going to talk about anything ugly, okay? But I want a few of you to share. When you think about the pastors you've had, some of you go back a few years, some of you go back 20 years, some of you go back longer than that. When you think about your pastors that you've had here at Friendship, my predecessors, in positive ways, what are the things that stand out to you about the, the pastors who made a significant impact upon you and your family uh, positively for Christ and his kingdom? And you can share who, or you can just share the quality that stood out. Encouragement. Encouragement. Concern about the congregation? Absolutely. I think the example that some of them had mm -hmm. led in mission fields yeah. particularly. Or personal example. It's one of the things we'll look at. If there's a there's a need for that. Anything else? I'll put it this way. I never do this, so yes. I'm thinking, I left, I'm up a year, two years, before my sister comes asking her questions. 
I think you, it's not you. The pastor is doing his job. That's his. That's my point. And sis, my sister is right. I'm saying the pastor usually has it up here. Yes, I'm saying right. So when you think about when you think about your pastors, you're thinking about someone who encourages you, someone who sets an example for you, someone who demonstrates concern for God's people. When you think about the function of a pastor, what are the things that you call to mind? What do you expect your pastor to do? Lead us. To lead? Okay. I expect to be an ugly shepherd when I expect to be being taught on and speaking the Bible. Okay. So accuracy, accuracy. in his preaching. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think I think honesty is helpful here for us. Just to be, what do we really expect? So, so Sherry talked about the the shepherding. We want him to be a good shepherd, but that's a that's a big generic term. What do we really mean by that? And I think a lot of us do mean when, when we're in the hospital, we want our pastor to be there, right? Tom. <laughs> So, so he can't stand apart from, we'll talk about that in a moment, that's good. Cynthia said to be there in, in times of death, and I think that's absolutely true. We, we expect our pastor to be present in the midst of those things. What, what else? Yeah, we expect him to be approachable, right? We, we don't want our pastor to be up here and people down here. We, we want there to be a connection. Um, so, so let me let you in on a secret. So, so everybody in the world has been asking, why are you preaching from the floor? <laughs> It is not because of the cameras. It's not because of the air condition. You should have known that this morning. Uh, it's it's not for any. It's not because uh, of anything. Nobody suggested it. It's it's truly because the week of Bible school we had stuff on the platform and I couldn't stand up there and I preached from the floor and I thought I connected better to you than any other time. So we just went went with it and like I told somebody, I don't know if it's forever, but it's for now. Uh, and so there you go. Uh, but approachable. We want we want to be able to connect. What anything else? A friend. A friend. I needed. I think you said a prayer warrior. No, somebody else did. Andy. Andy. I'm sorry. A prayer warrior. Right. We we want our pastor to pray. I think that's absolutely right. Trey, can I put you on the spot? From, from watching your dad's ministry for a lifetime, what stood out to you about what he? So, so my, yeah, I think I'll share this. My, my grandfather was a pastor for 40 years. Not perfect. He would have been the first person to tell you that. Um, but what I knew of his ministry and listening to my dad and, and my aunt and uncle talk about watching their father care for God's church, um, it, it was the undying burden <laughs> for God's people. Um, it, it was, I think, the same thing. that It never ended. It was the constant concern uh, because... The minute that you get one issue resolved, something else is coming up, and it, it is that ongoing thing. And I think we all ought to have respect for our pastor's time. He must take his time with his family and uh, not give it all to us. I don't, 
I don't know any pastor who would disagree with me. Well, I think that's I think that's spot on. Why don't you look at First Peter chapter five? First Peter chapter five. Peter says this, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. So, so what do you see here? P Peter has now, he not only looks at himself as an apostle, he is, he is, right? He has that standing. But he also sees himself as a part of this new leadership in the church. He has a, a different sort of connection to the church. He's a part of the group of elders. He says, as, an, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. And here he gives the direction. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And then he tells us how. I'm so glad he did. He tells us how. He says, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So let's walk through it. Number one, Peter says, here's your job as you're an elder, you're a pastor, uh, you, you're an overseer, you have this functionary position in the church to lead, govern, and teach. Here is your work that God's called you to do. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So number one, I think Peter identifies that the pastoral responsibility is local. I am not, and my predecessors were not, and my successors will not be shepherds to all of St. Clair County. I, I'm not the pastor to the fire department. I, I'm not the pastor to the police department. I, I'm not the pastor to, to the people out here in Friendship Community who've never identified with a local church. I'm the pastor of Friendship. That's important. Because the function of the pastor's office to exercise oversight, to lead God's people to, as we've learned in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, have charge over the souls of God's people is a localized responsibility. It is unique to his function as the shepherd of a particular people. And that gets us in trouble sometimes because you have pastors whose hearts are wide as, as the Mississippi and they want to welcome anybody and everybody and they want to run after every particular need. But I'll just tell you, sometimes we do have to draw the line. And if we have to draw the line as a shepherd, where are we going to serve and who are we going to give of ourselves to, it's always and, and foremost going to be to the church that we're responsible for. Because those are the people that we have a connection to and a commitment to in Christ. Now, Peter says that you should exercise oversight of the, of the flock that is among you. And he says to exercise oversight, that means that, number one, you've got to know what's going on. There's a responsibility for the pastor to have a clue on what's going on. Uh, I don't, I, I know sometimes it seems this way, but I don't want to be a dictator. And, and I don't try to manage everything, but I do try to know what's going on. It's the reason I show up to all committee meetings. It's the reason that I dialogue with those who are in leadership on a regular basis. Uh, because I like to have some idea of what's going on in the life of the church. And we all know that the pastor is usually the last person to know anything. One of the reasons I ask, what's going on in your Sunday school class? What prayer requests have been shared? Who told you that somebody died in their family? Because I promise you, I probably don't know about it. These things matter. Exercising oversight. And then he gives a, a gut check on the pastor's heart, doesn't he? He says, not under compulsion, but willingly. It's a good reminder to those who are called to this office that, that our job is not to gripe or grumble about this work that God's called us to do. It's it's not to continually be frustrated that there are demands on our time, even demands that are never ending, but it is a call to recognize that this is a holy work. It is a special service unto the Lord. It is something unique in the life of God's church, and it requires a generous and a joyful heart. He then says that we don't do this for shameful gain. We're going to see Paul's words to Timothy, and we'll be reminded that that a pastor is worthy of his hire. He should be able to make his living from his work. But at the same time, we, we don't want to be like so many 
profiteers who make their living off the gospel and actually not off the gospel but off, off of a false gospel that they preach. We, we are not the people who say if you'll send a seed, we'll, you know, we'll use it for the kingdom and you'll get a blessing and really all we're going to do is pat our pocket. That, that's not it. Then Peter says, what we do, we do eagerly. Not doing it for shameful gain. We do it eagerly. We, we want to serve God's people. We want to rise to the occasion. I, I'll just tell you, there, there are some, like in every profession, there are some sorry pastors out there. But the overwhelming majority of the pastors that I know, and in fact, I don't know of any pastor I associate myself with who isn't desirous of serving God's people. We don't do it perfectly. We certainly make mistakes. There are things we're going to overlook. But there's no pastor I know who's worth his salt who just says, you know what, I don't, I don't care about that family. I don't care about that need. I'm just going to ignore them. Uh, one of the things I think you ought to, to work on as a congregation, and not just with me, but anyone who serves in this office in the future, is, is presuming the best of intentions. To, to recognize that, that your shepherd has a, has a godly heart and longs to love and serve God's people well. And if he messes up, if he misses something, if he overlooks something, don't automatically assume that he did it willfully, that he wasn't desiring of an opportunity to serve. Because it's a part of the shepherd's heart to be eager to serve God's people. And then he gives us this instruction about how we oversee those who are in our charge. We're not to domineer over them. It goes back to that idea that we're not to be we're not to be forceful in a, in a mean-spirited way. We're not to be dictatorial. We're not to, we're not to throw our weight around in an effort to belittle anyone. And that's not to say that the shepherd shouldn't have authority. It's not to say that we shouldn't have great influence. It's not to say that it isn't the shepherd's responsibility to lead. It's just to say that in terms of the manner or the demeanor, in terms of the motivation, it's not there to to demonstrate uh, one's authority. It's not there to rally uh, some sort of popularity cult. We're not here in order to throw anyone aside uh, in an effort to exert our power, but, but we're here to love and serve God's people and to gently but insistently lead us to where God would call us. And then he goes back and he says we're to be examples to the flock, and we've mentioned that already. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. All of these are foundational elements to this one office that is so important to the life of the church. You know this. We've studied it together. I'm not going to belabor it, but I am going to remind us of it. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes that the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, and we could insert the office of pastor, or the office of elder, right? All these words mean the same thing. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. When you look at Titus chapter 1, and we've been there and done that, and so I'll just direct you to the most recent sermon. But when we look at Titus chapter 1, we find very much the same instruction, don't we? And the outline that we've given for it on a number of occasions, but it bears repeating, is that the pastor, the elder, the bishop, the overseer, is to have a grip on his family. He's to have a grip on his integrity. And he's to have a grip on his theology. And when he does, he is worthy of a grip on the church. One of, the, one of the things that I've encountered, and I think probably a lot of pastors have encountered something similar, uh, is the way that churches sometimes will split hair over what we trust the pastor to do. Uh, one of the first ways I ran into this was uh, that one of the churches that I served 
uh, didn't have a credit card in order to purchase things for the church. And so I, I broached that subject because I was often called upon to purchase things for the church and, and said, why don't we get a church credit card and we'll be able to take care of these things. And, and I was told in no uncertain terms, that's not going to happen. And so finally, after using my personal card over and over and over again, I said, well, I'm going to tell you something else that's not going to happen. We're not going to use the personal card anymore. So we just have to figure it out. And then I sat him down and I said, listen, here's what doesn't make any sense to me. You trust me to stand in the pulpit every Sunday and to teach and preach God's word. But you don't trust me to be a manager of the financial resources of the church. Those things are not congruous. They, 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 they don't make sense. They're out of sorts. One of the ways that we sometimes see this imbalance is, is when we trust the pastor to preach and teach God's word week after week. But when it comes to the administrating of church matters, we say, we'll handle that. You just stay out of it. I don't think you can effectively shepherd that way. I don't think you can care for God's church and fulfill the calling on your life as a pastor and not be involved in the leading the governing, and the teaching of God's church. It's why I have said every week as we walk through the book of Titus, and I will continue to say that when the church holds the pastor accountable but doesn't give him the authority to lead, then the church will be continually fruitless and the pastor will be continually frustrated. Let's turn to one other passage. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Here the Apostle Paul reminds us of the importance of this office to the life of the church in two ways. The first is in the way that a pastor is cared for out of his work. And the second is in our unwillingness to stain his reputation without good foundation. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, Let the elders, the pastors, who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when he treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. We, we've had occasion, just in the two and a half years that I've served as the pastor of friendship, for that last one to come into play. We, we've had occasion where a member of this congregation made slanderous statements against me. And there were people in the congregation who ran with it. Never came and asked if it was true. Ne never sought out to substantiate the things that they heard. Immediately assumed the worst about me and cut me off. And it took months and months and months to repair the damage that was done. In fact, in the eyes of some, the damage has never been recovered. I, I tell you that not because there's an impossible task there to overcome. I tell you that because it is incredibly dangerous when we slander the shepherd's reputation. The work of the pastor is so pivotal to the function of the church in fulfillment of the call of Christ that we should be unwilling to stomach a slanderous accusation, if there is not foundation, if there aren't credible witnesses, if there isn't a true reason to accept it, then we should not be willing to. We, we ought to presume the best and at the very least be willing to go and ask the question, this is what I've heard. Is it true? We had this just recently. We've, we've got a situation that we're dealing with even now where the name of friendship and my name are being slandered in our community across the county. And we've taken measures privately to go and address the issue and to try to keep it from spreading any further. But one of the things that that, that concerns me about is that, that the people will believe what they hear and it will hinder the work of God in this place. I'm telling you, the enemy loves to stir, loves to to draw attention to things that are without credibility. And I'll tell you this because I am not a perfect person. I've admitted to you a lot of my faults, and in the time of my shepherding here, I'll admit to you a lot more. 
So in no way do I offer myself up as a perfect example. But often the things that are lodged against us as shepherds are not true. We've got to be careful before we accept those things as gospel. Let me offer you some principles. Three principles about grace-gifted shepherds or grace-gifted pastors. Number one, grace-gifted shepherds take the task of preaching seriously by studying, preparing, and delivering with accuracy. And then they assess themselves regularly to do better. Grace-gifted pastors take the task of preaching seriously by studying, preparing, and delivering with accuracy. And then they assess themselves regularly to do better. My high school principal, Mr. Frank Lay, told us in our graduation ceremony that we ought to do right, and we ought to do good, and we ought to do better, and then we ought to do over. And I have taken that to heart for all these years now, that I should never be satisfied or settled in the fact that I've risen to a certain state. There's always room for improvement, even in preaching, especially in preaching. So I don't know what other pastors do, but I know what I do. I watch game film, just like a lot of football coaches go home and they run film and they try to see how they can do things better. I watch game film. I, I pull it out every Sunday morning, or Sunday afternoon when I'm, putting the sermons up online, I sit there and make myself watch it and I critique things. I come away and I say, I could have done that better. We could have transitioned here better. That could have been a little shorter. Every now and then I say that. <laughs> because I want to do a better job of serving you in the preaching of God's word. It matters. I think most grace-gifted shepherds are about that business of preaching and teaching with accuracy and always wanting to do better. Grace gifted shepherds, number two, take the shepherding of their flock seriously such that they want to know precisely who, are, who they are responsible for. And then write this down. They want to share their lives with them and they want to give their lives for them. Grace gifted shepherds take the responsibility of shepherding, that is the care of God's flock, the pastoral care of God's flock seriously such that they want to know precisely who they're responsible for. And once they know, they want to share their lives with them, and they want to give their lives for them. I, I've told you before, and if you ever ask, I'll give you the standard answer. I serve at the Lord's pleasure. And Mireille and I are here for as long as God will let us be here. And when the Lord puts upon our hearts to go somewhere else, we'll go somewhere else. But for as long as God has us here, and as long as I serve as the pastor of friendship, we want to lay everything out for the glory of God and for the building up of this church. It's why I care. It's why every good pastor cares. We want to live our lives with you, alongside you, among you. We don't want to be standoffish. In fact, one of the concerns that so many of you have heard us talk about and so many of you have been kind enough to pray for us about is us finding a home in this community, which is far harder to do in this market than you would think it should be. And the Lord's been kind and answered that prayer. And come the first part of September, we're going to close on a house in Springville, and, and we're going to be here, residents of St. Clair County, right here, not too far from the church. And I thank the Lord for that because it allows us to plant ourselves in the community where we serve and to know you even more, to welcome you even more into our lives. And I hope you know that I want to give myself for you. When Mary Ray and I were engaged, and she was learning all about this work of being a pastor's wife, and let me just say publicly, she is a great one. She's not here tonight because she's really sick at home, and I asked her to stay home, but she wonders a lot about her ministry to you all as a church, and I affirm her all the time, but I want to affirm her publicly. She does a fantastic job of caring for, especially for the ladies of this congregation. Uh, I'm astounded and amazed at the amount of work that she puts into it, and she's my partner in every way in this work. But when we were engaged and talking about this, I told, I told her, I said we get one opportunity to never be interrupted, and that's our honeymoon. Because for the rest of our lives, 
a call may come, and it means that we stop whatever we're doing and we go back. And she's never questioned that. And we've never questioned that. And sometimes our families question that. And sometimes grandmommy looks us in the eyes and she says, oh, I just don't want you to go. And we remind our families of the call of God upon our lives. And that loving and caring for God's people, even in the worst of times, is what we're called to do. It's what every good shepherd's called to do. Let me give you the third principle. Number, number three. Grace-gifted shepherds keep their end goal in mind and labor in all things to present the church to Christ at the last day, blameless and complete. It's what it's all about. It's what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 1, 28, 29. This is our work, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ might be blameless and complete at the last day. I don't want anybody who's a part of friendship to get to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and be missing or lacking in any way. I want to do whatever I can to equip you to fulfill the ministry that God has given to you so that on that day you can say, I gave it all for the glory of Christ. And he gave apostles, prophets, and evangelists, and shepherds to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Here's my challenge to you. Because maybe some of you will be called to this function in the church. But probably most of us are not going to be called to this. But when I ask you who, who's the pastor that comes to mind, for some of you it's it's somebody who served friendship. Maybe it's maybe it's John Faulkner. Maybe it's Cliff Vine. Maybe, maybe it's Roger White. Maybe you go back further. Maybe, maybe you go back to A.D. Prickett, who everybody loved. What a legacy he left behind. Or maybe you served the Lord in another church, and there's some other pastor that comes to mind. When I go home tonight, I'm going to pull out my stationery, and I'm, I'm writing a note. I've got two pastors in mind, and I'm going to write a note to both of them to remind them that they had an influence in my life and that I'm grateful for the sacrifices they made. I, my challenge is to you, would you do the same? Would you go home and the pastor that comes to your mind who's still living, would you sit down and write them a note and then you figure out this week what their address is and you send it to them? Or if you've got their phone number, call them. Call them on the way home from church tonight. And just tell them I just wanted to say I love you. And I appreciate that you've given yourself for the sake of Jesus and his church. Father, we thank you for those shepherds who've loved us and led us well. I think about my dear friend, Dr. Stan Pritchett. He is with you. He's more alive than he's ever been. But he was my pastor and loved me as a little boy and encouraged me in my walk with I think about, about my childhood pastor, Dr. David Spencer, who is still preaching the word, still loving your people, still caring for your church, still encouraging me. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you. Thank you for these men who've given their all to serve you by serving your church. Lord, thank you for the honor of serving this great congregation. Lord, I stand in a long line of faithful shepherds. Forty-one of them have come before me. Who knows how many will come after me. We all have one goal in mind. That is that at the last day, the people of God called Friendship Baptist Church might be given to you blameless and complete in Christ. So for the time that I steward and shepherd this great church, Help me to be found faithful so that we all might fulfill the ministry that we received from the Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name for his sake.